Morning. It is good to be with everybody again today. One more Sunday to be able to remind each other what God has done for us and how He's blessed us so much. But today I'd like to talk about one of those blessings that we may not even realize how much it's taken to get what we have in our possession. Uh, we're so used to picking up our Bibles, taking them everywhere we want to go. How many of us have several on a shelf for or here or there, different versions. It, we just have a, an abundance of Bibles available to us. But for us to have a Bible in English, that path has been a long and difficult one. In fact, you go back not too long ago in the, in the timeline of history and you find that there weren't any in English. Now, off and on through the years, there were some partial translations of a little bit in Old English and Middle English. But for the majority of people, to have a Bible they could look at and understand was not available at all. And so for us to have a Bible on our hands meant that somewhere along the way, there were people who stood up and said, everybody needs to be able to have a Bible in their own language. No matter what the law said, no matter what the consequences were. And so we have different folks who, who sat down and dedicated themselves to translating scriptures into English. And so we have folks like Tyndale, and, and his came along at just the perfect time because the printing press was started. And so they could make copies of it over and over and over again, and that it could be, straight, no matter how many copies were burned, they were able to make more and more and more. And, and there it started and more came out after that, just on and on and on until we get to today where we look at what we have. I think what we need to look at in this in this blessing is from this perspective. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is sent out by God to meet up with the eunuch who's been in Jerusalem to worship. And there in chapter 8, we find that the uh, he'd gone to, to worship and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Uh, for us, we look at that and go, oh, he was reading the Bible and okay. But to have a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was a very uncommon privilege. I, this just showed so much about what he had. And for us, it's just normal. But for him, it was something special because it's not something that everybody had in their home. It's not something that was available for everyone, that they, it had to be hand copied. And so it was a very expensive prospect. But now we know that everybody, everybody can have a Bible of their own. That it's not something for the rich, for the wealthy, or the well-placed. It's something for everybody. And no matter how poor somebody is, they can have a Bible of their own. It's just a, an amazing prospect that we see that, that we're blessed with that, with that possibility for everybody to have one. And, and beyond that is that we are blessed with an abundance of translations. Now, when you think about in English... We, we may know and be able to read off a handful and, and think about what they are, but there are 450 plus translations in English, different translations available. And so when you look at what is there and what's available, we have to realize that we don't just have a Bible available to us. We have all kinds of translations available to us that, to help us in this prospect. So like where the eunuch was reading in Isaiah, there in, in Isaiah 53, verse 7, we'll just do one verse. The NIV says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The New Living Translation says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Just a little bit different wording, but you can hear the meaning that's there. The New American Standard says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. In the American Standard, he was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter and as a sheep that before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now, just that one little verse we see a diversity in, in how that thought was expressed and how it was put together. And so as we look at that, we see, see how that was done. Now, the question might be, why do we need so many translations? 
Why are there so many? Why do you even worry about it? And, and part of that, it comes about because, well, I read the American Standard, which was put out in 1901. When we use the word dumb, our first thought isn't the idea of somebody who's silent and unable to speak. Our first thought is somebody who's unintelligent. You see how that word has changed in meaning. And so from 1901 till now, we find that here we have words that have changed in their meanings. And to make the word, the the scripture understandable, new translations have come out to adjust for that. Not just the changes in words, but changes in culture to try to express the idioms that are there. In Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 27, there's a couple words that, that show that. In the NIV it says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And we read that and go, that, that is such a true statement that how we live ought to reflect what we've been given through Christ. The King James says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, in, in those two words, they sound opposite because for us, conversation means talking with somebody. But for this time, conversation was a way that we live. So the changes that go on have necessitated changes in translations. And so we have revisions to different translations. We don't just have this one, but we find that they've been updated and they've been changed through the years to reflect the changes in language and understanding that we have today. Now, if you have a whole lot of different translations, what happens? We all have our favorite. It's just a natural response that we find what, what feels right to us, it sounds right to us, it resonates with us. And so it may be the one we grew up with, and so we hold on to it. It may be one that we've come across that just is so, it says it in such a way that we can understand it and read it, and it really has meaning to us. You know, um, it would appear that Jesus had his own favorite translation as well. Now, if you think about it, we may think, oh, he used the, the Hebrew Bible, and so he didn't have a translation. But if you go through the Gospels, if you go through the New Testament, most of the quotes from the Old Testament are not from the Hebrew, but from the Greek translation of the Hebrew, the Septuagint, which has some wordings that are a little bit different. And so we find when Jesus speaks, when he's quoted there in the Gospels, we hear him utter the same words as they're phrased in the Septuagint, as opposed to the way they were in Hebrew. And so for us to have a, a translation that we use would just be a natural part. Now, the thing about our favorites is some, we have to be careful because I think we'll take what we like and we'll make it more about than just our preference. We'll, we'll talk about it framed in this is the most accurate Bible or this is the, the best translation. And a lot of times it sounds more like the sales pitch for the translation than what we actually know about what's going on. And so we have to be careful that we don't make the translation more than what it really is. There's a meme, if y'all may have seen this one, that's going around about the difference between the King James and the modern translations. And it says that when you look at the King James and you look at one of the modern translations, you find that there are thousands of words and bunches of verses that have been taken out of modern translations that are in the King James. And it sounds, sounds like the modern translations had just jettisoned all these verses to make things the way they want them to be. But the thing is, if we make 16... 1611, 1620, you take 1611, this time when the King James came out as our reference point, it sure sounds like everything that's come in the 400 years since has changed dramatically. But the thing is, our reference point isn't the 1600s. If you take the King James and you go back to when the New Testament was written and you find all the writings about the year 100 and you, you laid them out and you compared it to the King James, do you know what your view would be? You would say, look at all the verses and words that were added to the text because we found now in, in older manuscripts of the Greek New Testament in, in more uh, plentiful uh, copies of it to be able to make comparison across that we found that what the King James translators had to use to translate the English wasn't what was ideal. And so they had words and they had verses that weren't in the originals as best as we could tell. So when we think about how all of that fits together, we have to remember that translations are translations. And we have to keep a, a picture of what ought to be and what God wants. So how, how is it that we want to choose being blessed by all that God has given us in these translations? 
I, now, the one thing I can say is every translation, somebody can pick up and go get to know God. That the King James, we can pick that up still and learn so much about Christ and God and, and come to an understanding what God has in mind. And so we, we don't throw any of them out because we know oh, they have a benefit. Now, there's two main ways, generally, and, and there's a, a spectrum of them, two main philosophies in translation. And one of them is a word-for-word -word translation. And so when we you think about word-for-word, -word, I think that's one that tends to be called out as a favorite because it sounds like it'd be most, most accurate. But the challenge in word-for-word -word is you take a word and what word goes with it. When you think about a foreign language and you translate from one word to another, there's not always just one word that fits the other. The word uh, parakaleo in the Greek, if, you, if there's a, like a hundred uh, some odd times when it's used in the New Testament. Now the NIV uses about 12 different words to translate it. The King James has about nine or 10 different words to translate it. And so when you think about that, it's like, well, word for word, which word do you use? And that's the challenge with word for word translation is this isn't just picking this word that means this word is trying to understand what the, what does that word mean in the context and how do you put it together? So it, it lays it out like first John. Well, I, I'll, I'll give you one of those. I use word parakleo. Now, this is that's the verb, the uh, the word paracle, the paraclete, the idea of the noun, the one who is the, the steps in between for us in first John chapter two, verse one says, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That word advocate is the word paraclete. It's the idea of somebody that, who's there and on our side. Now, the Good News Bible says it this way. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So which one is most accurate? Well, the, the NIV would be closer to the word for word. It uses the word advocate. But how many po people nowadays understand the word advocate? And so the Good News Bible said to have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf. And so you see, trying to get that meaning across with word for word. An another challenge with word for word is when we translate it, it doesn't stay in a word order. The first words in Genesis 1, Bereshit bara Elohim. That, what that begins, if you go word for word, is Bereshit is one word in the Hebrew the way Hebrew works, but we translate it into English, the meaning, in the beginning, because it has prefixes that designate in and the and then beginning. And so it, it, in, it starts out in the beginning, but Bereshit bara, the word bara is the word created, and then Elohim, God. So literally, in word order, it's in the beginning created God. Now for English, that doesn't work. We have to flip that around and put the subject before the verb so that it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we, we look at that and we have to realize that word for word does mean sometimes there's not exact words that fit and we have to change things up to make them fit the role of the language. It, it's just one of the philosophies for translation. The other tra uh, philosophy of translation is thought for thought. Dynamic equivalence is the phrase that's used for it. Now, it's thought for thought. The strength for it is that it, it focuses on trying to make it understandable. So we, we talked about in 1 John 2, 1, instead of saying advocate, they, they chose to translate it in a way that trying to make it understandable as opposed to somebody trying to understand the word advocate and, and going from there. So the, the challenge for, for thought for thought is that it kind of limits what goes on because instead of it tries to give the meaning, and sometimes it limits what the meaning could be as opposed to what is. Down in, in chapter 2, uh, 1 John again, verses 12 and 13, the NIV talks about three groups of people. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children. I'm writing to you, fathers. I'm writing to you, young men. And so we can talk about what does he mean, children? What does he mean, fathers? What does he mean, young men? Now, the New Living Translation says, I'm writing to you who are God's children. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith possibility. But in, in making the phrase, sometimes it limits the, the, uh, the under, what could be in the text as opposed to just limiting it to this understanding and this meaning of it all. So when we look at all of that, we, we know that word for word has its limits, thought for thought has its limits. And both of them, and usually most of them, have an in-between 
uh, and use a little bit of both because we've got to in the process. Now, there is something that I know is true. One thing that I know is true in all of this, no matter what goes on, this is true, that God's word is inspired, that it's given to him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17, that God has had a part in this. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word is inspired. But on the flip side of that, we have to remember that no translation comes from God. Every translation is a work of man. And so we have to take care in making pronouncements about this translation or that. Every translation has its strengths. Every translation has its weaknesses. And so we want to, to speak where God has spoken, not to make our opinion part of what God has in mind. So when we think about all of that, then knowing that the Word of God is, is inspired, but the translations aren't, how do we choose a translation? There are principles that God has given to us that help us to look at the translations and decide, what do I need to use? What does God want for us? What is His desire that would guide us in, in choosing what a translation would be? I think the first thing is that if we're going to follow what God wants, we're going to choose a translation that we will read. We will read. I see a, a Bible sitting on a shelf gathering dust isn't doing what God wants it to do. God wants us to pull that open and read it. And if it's a translation we struggle with, that we can't understand, that we stumble over the words because they're more than what we can do, we won't read it. God has always emphasized reading Scripture. Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Whoop, now, nah, here, I started, I jumped ahead. Now, go, going back to Acts 8 with the eunuch. Here it is. He's reading. He knew the importance. The eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Paul tells Timothy, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Read it, he says, to open up and, and to give what God has given. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says, We do not write you anything you cannot read or understand. I see that's an important point, that God wants us to be able to read what's there. And, and the idea of reading, it reminds us that reading level matters. Reading level matters. And if I can't, if I struggle to read something because I'm not where I can read something of a higher reading level, like the King James is like a 12th grade reading level, but that doesn't sound like it's much. But the reality is most of us don't read at that level. Most of us are more comfortable with reading at lower levels. And so like the NIV is about a seventh grade reading level. We have others that even are a little bit more. And none of them are negative. It just says this is what's understandable. And, and we always talk about that with the children. We want the children to have a Bible that can read and they can, they can get through without having to struggle. And it applies to adults as well, that we want everyone to have a Bible that they can read and that they're familiar with the words so they don't have to struggle to get through it to be able to get what God has in mind for us. Because God's goal is for us to take the Word of God and make it personal. And so when we have my Bible, the one that I'm familiar with, that I read, that it's part of who I am, it is, it is so very important that we have that. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, 17, verse 19, in talking about one day there's going to be a king, and one of the rules that God gives to his people is that the king has to handwrite his own copy of the Word of God. Handwrite his own copy of the Word of God. And also, then he takes, takes that, that copy of the scroll, and then it's to be with him, he says. He is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. Yeah, he's to have his own copy, and he's to read it. God wants us to have our own copy. He wants us to read it so that it becomes part of our lives. So what's the second principle? To choose, to choose a translation. What God desires for us isn't just that we read it. He wants us to read it, but he also wants us to understand it. At, at times, I think part of that means that we have to have more than one translation to help us understand what God has given us, to, to be able to, to go on to it. See, when Philip comes up to the eunuch, what did he ask him? When he sees him reading in the chariot, he comes up to him, and the first thing that Philip asks him is, do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? God wants us to understand. Back over in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. To understand it. 
God wants us to understand, and the translations help us to do that. And so we gather up translations that go, this one says it in a way to help me understand what God has in mind for us. And that's part of study and, and learning what God wants for us. So we want to take the reading to get to understanding, because when we understand it, then we can live it. In Nehemiah chapter 8, it's interesting, has, as Ezra, they set up and have all the people gathered. And he begins to open up the, the Word of God to read it before everybody. And all the people are listening to it as they, as they go along. And it says the Levites, they read from the book of the law and they make it clear to the people, giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. And then when you get further on down, they're, they're mourning, they're grieving because they realize they haven't been doing what God wants them to do. But the thing is, they were there for a festival, for a feast that God had given them. And so it says, this is a holy day, don't grieve. And they all went, went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They understood and it translated into their actions. They understood and they lived it out. And what God wants for us is for us to take what he's given, to read it, to understand it, and to put it into our lives so that it's the central part of who we are. Now, to get this English Bible, part of what I did mention was the cost for us to be able to read what we have in English. There were men and women who gave their lives because they had the desire to do what we're able to do today. William Tyndale, after he translated and uh, had his Bible put out on and on, he was eventually arrested. And then he was sentenced to death. They strangled him, and then they burnt his body at, a, at, at the post, and so at the stake. And so it's, he gave his life to be able to put God's Word into English so everyone can understand it. There were about seven folks who died because they taught their children the Lord's Prayer in English instead of Latin. Can you imagine to teach their children what God wanted in the language they understood? They lost their lives. On and on, when people were found in possession of an English Bible, they were put to death. They were arrested. The Bibles were burned. All because they wanted to learn and understand what God had in mind. They died to be able to read and understand God's Word. I think, in a, in a sense... I wonder if we realize that we will die spiritually if we're not reading and understanding God's Word. We, we're, we're spoiled by all of this blessing. Maybe we've forgotten how important it is for us in our lives. So does our living reflect that we read and understand God's Word? That's God's desire for all of us, to be His completely in every way. Let's pray together. Father, we're so very grateful that you have blessed us with your word. Oh, my Father, help us. Help us to seek it, to thirst and hunger for it, to want to be more the men and women you desire us to be. Father, we, we are so very grateful for what you've given us through your Son, this life, this hope, this joy. And today, Father, help us to live in a way that reflects who we are through your Son. For through Jesus we pray. Amen. May God bless you and keep you all this week. So we look forward to, to being together once again.